This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. This is the final show of the year. Thomas and I have really enjoyed this show, and we're renewed for next year. So we're real excited. Folks, the COVID-19 is still here. It's spreading. Our hospitalizations are up. Our cases are up. The bed capacity is getting scarce. And candidly, our workforce is fatigued. But let's don't end the year negative. Let's focus on the fact we do have a vaccine coming. But for the next six months, we got to continue doing our part. And to help us do that, we decided to bring back John Barry. We had him in the summer. He did a fantastic job comparing COVID-19 to the great influenza in 1918. We're going to dust that off. If you missed it, you're in for a real treat. If you didn't, you'll learn from this as we prepare for the new year. John Barry is professor at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and he's a distinguished scholar at Tulane's Bywater Institute. And as Steve mentioned, he wrote two books of note, The Rising Tide about the 1927 Mississippi flood, and the one that we're talking about here, The Great Influenza, obviously about that 1918 pandemic. Here is our interview with Steve Love and John Barry. For many of our listeners, they may not know the great influenza that started in 1918. In your book, you describe how 613 American troops were admitted to a hospital initially, and only one died. And in a British fleet, there were 10,313 sailors that got infected, and only four died. Can you explain kind of the three-day fever and then how it turned into a real lethal uh, infection? Right. The, the key is that influenza, unlike COVID-19, influenza is one of the fastest mutating viruses in existence. There was a first wave in the spring of 1918 that was not widespread. A lot of places didn't see any evidence of influenza whatsoever. And those that did, it was generally pretty mild, in fact, very mild, as, as you just recounted. There were even medical journal articles saying this looks and smells like influenza, but it can't really be influenza because it's not killing enough people. But apparently the virus mutated and came back with a real, truly killing force in the fall. In total, the uh, 1918 pandemic killed between 50 and 100 million people if you adjust for population. That would be equivalent to like 220 to 440 million people today. Now, fortunately, wow. there are two things. Number one, there isn't the slightest sign anywhere in the world, and there is a tremendous amount of surveillance and analysis of the genome and so forth and so on. There's no sign that this virus is mutating in any direction toward virulence. It's a much more stable virus than influenza. And secondly, it, you know, it's plenty dangerous as it is, uh, but fortunately it is not as virulent as the 1918 virus. You know, in reading your book, and I know you said this was speculation uh, and it had not been proven, but there was a theory that in February of 1918 that potentially this pandemic, or at least uh, the spread of the virus, may have come out of Haskell County, Kansas, and it potentially went from a pig to a human being. Uh, that's just one theory, I assume. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. There's been a lot of, the book originally came out in 2004. There's been a lot of work since then. And I believe that I had located, in fact, I still believe that I had located the first outbreak reported anywhere in the world of a uh, violent form of influenza that was in Haskell, Kansas, which is actually not that far from the Texas border on the southwest corner of Kansas, near that narrow strip of Oklahoma above Texas. That was actually in late January 1918. And you could trace people going from this rural area in Kansas to the previously the first known outbreak, which was at an army base for what is now Fort Riley 
But work since the book came out, you know, has convinced me that my favorite site of origin now is probably China, although uh, Kansas is still a possibility. Uh, other hypotheses out there are France in 1915 uh, and Vietnam, and New York City is actually a possibility. We now know that there was an, an outbreak in New York City in February, probably a little bit later than Haskell, but we don't know, maybe it was a little bit before. Possibly there was some you know, movement of people from Haskell to New York or the other way around. It's not in, in China, but the evidence for China is chiefly that China was not particularly hard hit in the fall wave when everybody else was very hard hit, which pretty strongly suggests they had some uh, immune protection because they had been exposed to the virus before. But we don't know and we'll probably never know. You know, in reading uh, your book, this particular uh, 1918 influenza really had waves. It came in like three waves. And it was amazing some areas like California, Iowa, Kentucky, New Orleans that you cited. Also in Savannah, Georgia, uh, I think on January the 15th of 2019, actually had to, for the third time, close public places and theaters. Do you see any similarities from the waves you described in your book and what we're seeing with COVID-19? The waves are, you know, fairly standard for an influenza pandemic. You know, there are at least 2009, 1968, 1957, 1918, 1889. Uh, those are ones that we've got some fairly good data on. And, of course, the more modern ones, we've got a lot of good data. And they did all come in waves. But one thing that's a little bit different about COVID-19 is we intervened to stop the first wave. We still run the risk, and this is of great concern, it should be to everybody, it certainly is to me, that if we do not get the baseline of transmission way, way down, when the weather does in fact turn colder and more people do tend to be inside, then it's going to get a lot worse. You know, fortunately, we've gotten a much, much better at treating the disease itself. We know how to take care of We know there are blood clots, so you give anticoagulants. Uh, we know the immune system is, is fighting so hard to kill the virus in the lung, the so-called cytokine storm, that, that we uh, are suppressing some of the immune system's action so that cytokine storm doesn't kill you, uh, and, and so forth and so on. We've done a lot better treating it, brings the case mortality down below, but it's still higher than it would than it should be if we use the public health measures. Which, by the way, appear not to be being used very much right now because we are having a massive COVID spike in North Texas. This is the biggest capacity our hospitals have had of COVID patients since the pandemic began earlier this year. We're talking with author Dr. John Barry. We spoke to him back in the summer. He's the author of The Great Influenza about the 1918 pandemic. And when we come back, we are going to pick up the conversation talking about economic impacts and his thoughts on that. Back with John Barry and Steve Love next on the human side of healthcare. This is the human side of healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the radio.com app where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. Welcome back to the human side of healthcare. We're going to continue our discussion with John Barry and looking at the parallels between the great influenza and today's COVID-19. John, what about the economic impact? What happened in 1918 and do you see any parallels today? There have been several studies actually pretty recently, by two different Federal Reserve banks that tracked the economies in different cities in 1918. And they found that the cities that stayed closed the longest had significantly better economic recoveries than those cities, which did not. And that's kind of interesting. But one of the big differences between COVID-19 and influenza is duration, starting with the incubation period, 
uh, one to four days for influenza, two to 14 days for COVID, uh, how long it takes the disease to develop, how long you're sick, how long you shed virus. All these things are much longer, generally three times as long for COVID-19 as for influenza. And that creates different economic stresses. And whether it's seasonal influenza or the 1918 pandemic, when influenza hits a city, it generally takes six to 10 weeks before it peaks and then pretty much leaves. In, in 1918, probably two thirds of the total deaths over a two year period occurred in about 14 or 15 weeks in the fall of 1918 worldwide. But in a, any particular location, it was generally considerably shorter than that. So the economic stress from this disease is considerably greater than the economic stress that was put on in 1918. It was very intense in 1918, but it was over in a much shorter period of time. Uh, so the comparisons aren't that useful, except to know what, what I said already, that uh, according to a couple of Federal Reserve studies, the, the cities that stayed closed the longest uh, had better economic recoveries. They took the pain for the long-term gain, didn't they? Exactly. So you know SARS came and went. So how long do you think we're going to have to deal with this? Well, I don't know how long you're talking about it, be talking about it. I think it's here forever. You know, SARS was entirely different. We managed to completely eliminate that from the human population. That's because SARS was not easily transmissible. You know, uh, when you were most infectious with SARS, you were flat on your back, very possibly under, you know, experiencing a cytokine storm. You weren't going anywhere and you weren't infecting anybody in the community. The SARS transmission is the same for MERS, uh, another coronavirus that was lethal. A whole lot of that occurred in the hospital setting. This virus is entirely different, either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission. Unless you get a really, really effective vaccine, something like measles, which is in the, you know in the high 90 percent, this virus is here to stay. That's ominous. That's not what everybody just wanted to hear. Well, I think we'll have drugs that that will be effective. We've already learned so much. Even you know, you do have two drugs now: the steroid dexamethasone, if I said that right, and remdesivir. Uh, that are probably cut mortality rates and just the way we've learned to treat people, uh, treating maybe the damage that the, the virus does, as I said earlier, anticoagulants to handle the blood clots, immunosuppressives to uh, prevent the cytokine storm. We've gotten a lot better at uh, and not automatically putting people on respirators when their oxygenation goes down. We saved a lot of lives by learning how to handle the virus, even with just supportive care. You know, a vaccine is going to make significantly more progress. I'm very optimistic, not that I'm a virologist, but we know that the target for a vaccine, the so-called spike protein, is very stable. And if the target is stable, then you ought to be able to hit it. It's different from influenza, where the the, uh, target for the vaccine mutates very rapidly, which is why you need a a new shot every year. Even if you need repeated shots for coronavirus, uh, or boosters, you know, they, they will significantly cut down both illness and severity of illness. And in the meantime, we've got a lot of drugs that are that are going to be tried out to see what impact they have. You know, just this week, uh, a form of interferon beta that you inhale, uh, a very tiny, very small uh, a trial, but highly successful in preventing serious disease. And I'm sure the monoclonal antibodies, those are probably come online. We have hope for high hopes for them. So even if the disease sticks around for a long time, essentially forever, uh, the treatments and the preventions should improve dramatically. And finally, there's a hypothesis that just uh, your own immune system once you've seen been exposed to the disease once, your immune system might get pretty good at preventing it naturally, or at least preventing a serious attack naturally. I know Klaus Storr, uh, who used to head the World Health Organization's influenza program, and is a pretty good virologist, I know he's hypothesized this, and, and I 
have thought the same thing, even, but I'm not a virologist, so I don't have any credentials to, to articulate that hypothesis, even though I just did, but you know, I like to pontificate like other people. <laughs> even though the virus is going to be around indefinitely, it's not going to be as ferocious as it is now. You know, that's uh, pretty good news, really, because we have the common cold coronavirus. We have the flu. We've learned to coexist with that. Wouldn't it be great if we had this vaccine and the vaccine we have could really eradicate it to the point we don't have to coexist with it? Yeah, that's actually Klaus Storrs. Uh, he goes so far as to, as to say that he thinks it'll become similar to common cold. There is one important difference, though. Uh, the coronaviruses that cause a co- common cold do not bind to cells in the lung. They only bind to the upper respiratory tract. So uh, unless COVID-19 lost that ability to bind to cells in the lung, then it always will have that possibility of causing very severe disease in some people. There were a lot of national and international voices over the last five plus years saying that the next big thing that we're going to deal with is a pandemic. What do you see as far as future pandemics? No, it's not just four or five years. Try, you know, at least 20 years. Tommy Thompson, the Bush's first, uh, George W. Bush's first health and human services secretary, was at a meeting on pandemic influenza on September 11th, 2001, and thought it was so important when the planes hit the towers. Initially, he was reluctant to leave the meeting. Obviously, uh, W. Bush took the threat very, very seriously, passed a $7 billion bill for pandemic preparedness, created the national stockpile, vaccine manufacturing technology, so forth and so on, a planning process, all those things were important. So it's not just the last four or five years that's been going on essentially forever among public health people. Meanwhile, the investment in public health has gone straight down. If there's a benefit from this pandemic, it might be investment in public health afterwards. However, that is not a guarantee because, I mean, Ebola didn't see any uptick in public health investment after it. Uh, the 2009 sort of pandemic that wasn't because it was so mild uh, that didn't see any uptick in public health investment after it. And there is so much financial pressure on every government right now that remains to be seen. One would help that public health and, and general scientific research and, and uh, research into viruses in general got a major financial boost, but there is no guarantee. John, this has been amazing. What a great interview. You know, I always try to take the opportunity to allow the guests to have some final remarks. Do you have any? I think the most important thing, the lesson from 1918 was that people in authority needed to tell the truth. You know, in the uh, pandemic plans for the federal government for every state, and I participated in the conceptualizing of those plans, uh, at least a federal plan. That was the message that I pushed in every meeting I attended. And that is written into the federal plan and it's written into the state plans. But you still have to have somebody to execute the plan. And as a result, we've got people who still don't believe this is a serious threat. Uh, but that minority is getting smaller and smaller. And I guess the, the single message again is you know, if we comply with the public health guidelines, we can get control of the virus if we comply with the guidelines. And if we do that, then the economy comes back nearly 100 percent. So let's do it. You know, Thomas, that was fascinating hearing John Barry. Good food for thought. We're facing the same situation today. History does repeat itself. We've got to do our part. Wear our mask, physical distance, wash our hands. That is the eternal message from this radio show until this pandemic is over. When we come back, we're going to talk about the holiday blues with Dr. Gonzalo Perez Garcia from Texas Health Presbyterian. That's next on the Human Side of Healthcare. 
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. We want to continue our discussion today related to seasonal depression. You know, as we approach New Year and the New Year's, we need to look back. Some people may still be depressed from the holidays. Some people may still have issues. And we couldn't have a better person to help lead this discussion today than Gonzalo Perez Garcia, who's a psychiatrist and serves on the medical staff at Texas Health Dallas. Dr. Garcia, thanks for being with us. Sure, absolutely. Happy, happy to help. You know, for our listeners who may themselves or have a friend or family member that they've noticed some type of depression, especially over the holiday week and as we approach New Year, how do you think they should recognize these types of symptoms in their loved ones? I think the main thing to look out for is if your loved ones aren't acting themselves. You know, if they're normally a happy, cheerful person, and instead over the holidays, they're looking very reserved, not as talkative, not reaching out as much. I think that's the main thing to look at. You know, depression is usually comes with a lack of interest in things that normally interest you. So people will stop doing hobbies, they'll stop doing things that make them happy, they'll stop reaching out to friends. So if you kind of sense that in a loved one, that they're not doing the things they usually do, that's the main thing to look for. What causes, in your mind, this seasonal depression that some people experience? There are multiple factors that lead to that. Um, first, some of it is, is biologic. Um, you know, During the winter months, there are less hours of sunlight, and the sun's going down right as most of us are, are finishing our work. And sun is where we get vitamin D, and vitamin D determines how much uh, serotonin we have in our bodies. So just by the mere fact that we're getting less sunlight than we did three, four months ago, uh, that can increase depression because of the biologic process. Um, then secondly, there, can, there are psychological factors. You know, uh, some, might, some people, um, the holidays are not a happy time for them. They might have bad memories of, of Christmas with stressful families, and that can, that can affect things. Um, or loss of a loved one. You know, if uh, someone lost a parent or a sibling or a child, and they had happy memories with that loved one around Christmas time, Christmas is, can serve as a reminder of that person's not here in your life. Your life is different now. Uh, and, of course, just the, the cold weather. You know, we, we live in Texas, which is normally a, a nice warm place to be, and as it gets colder, that can certainly uh, affect the mood as well. Uh, on top of that, we have the new stressors this year of the pandemic, where a lot of people are probably going to have uh, different Christmas traditions. They may not go home to visit family. They may not go to a crowded shopping mall like they like to do or, or whatever other, you know, or whatever other Christmas traditions they have, everything's been put on hold still, and that can certainly affect things. You know, when you think in terms of holiday blues or seasonal depression, do you have some nuggets of suggestions, if you will, for our listeners or how to manage those holiday blues? Yeah, so if it's holiday blues, the best thing to, to try and do is, is, you know, do your best to break the cycle. You know, if you see yourself not reaching out to folks, um, not doing things you normally do, try and try and do something. You know, you may not be able to go to the orchestra or go shopping in the, in the mall, mall like you usually do, but you can still get in your car, drive around, see the Christmas lights. Um, now, of course, if it's severe depression, those things might not work, and then that's where things you know, step up and you need to see a professional and, and things like that. But in general, it's important not to do too much substances. Um, watch your alcohol intake. Um, you don't want a lot of people turn to alcohol um, as a way to kind of briefly forget and de-stress. And if that gets too out of hand, that creates a whole a whole new set of problems. Uh, getting enough sleep is important, even if you're off school or not working right now. Um, you know, studies show that it's still important to get regular sleep on the same schedule uh, in order to keep our, our mood balanced. And it's important to best you can to reach out to people you like. And I think it's easier now than it was even 10, 20 years ago because we can text people, we can FaceTime people, we can message friends from high school on social media that normally we wouldn't even think to contact them. So just you know, reaching out to others and then uh, is a good way to do it. And even if you're not feeling low, reach out to someone else because you don't know who 
who, who themselves might be feeling down that might feel very pleased to, to hear from you or to get a message from you, even if it's just liking a photo on their social media. Exercise is also very important. Obviously, it's ha- harder in the colder months, um, but exercise definitely helps uh, mood as well. What would you say to our listeners as they are experiencing the blues or depression? What are things that they really should avoid? And when should you help a friend or family member seek professional help? So again, avoid too much substance use. Um, Avoid drinking too much alcohol. Try not to isolate yourself too much. And again, isolation is something we've been uh, we've been told to do because of, of the COVID pandemic. But again, we live in a modern society where isolation can also mean you stop texting people, you stop you know, going on social media and talking to folks. So avoid those, those sorts of things. You know, try and be your best to be sociable um, in, a, in a safe way. Um, but the time to seek professional help is when those things aren't working, where no matter how much you push yourself, you don't want to reach out to people, you don't even want to turn on the TV and watch your favorite show. Uh, if you don't want to get out of bed and do anything. It's also important to seek out professional help when these symptoms affecting your life. So if you're not working as hard as you usually do, if you're not playing with your kids as much as you used to, or enjoying spending time playing with your kids as much as you used to, that's affecting your personal life, your occupational life, and it's important to to seek help. And of course, the absolutely the, the thing we worry about the most is suicidal thoughts. So if things get to the point that you start wishing you were dead, wishing you could harm yourself in some way, or thinking about harming yourself in some way, uh, there's no reason to hesitate but to call 911 and get the help that you need. You know, I'm going to pivot just a little bit, and let's look to the new year. And there is hope related to COVID-19. We now have a vaccine. But it's going to take a while for that to be completely distributed to all the people. So let's pretend like You know, it's May or June before it gets to all the public. So say over the next six months, what do you think are realistic goals that people should set for themselves as they look to 2021? Yeah, some some good realistic goals, I think, again, is to continue to reach out to friends and family as much as you can from from that safe distance, Uh, whether that's text or video chat or Facebook uh, whatever else, or phone calls, whatever else it may be, um, because it can feel isolating. You can, with the way COVID is going, it can feel like you're the only one stuck at home, not doing anything. But all of us are doing that. Um, so if we all work together and reach out to, to family and friends, we're all helping each other through this time. Uh, hearing a friend's voice or seeing their picture or seeing their face on your phone can can certainly lift one's spirits. So I think that's one realistic goal. You know, as we wait for everyone to get this vaccine and we're still trying to keep ourselves safe uh, from COVID, um, we still can, can do a lot from just the power of our phone or, or our computer. Um, and also getting exercise again. As it starts warming up, even if it's just a quick walk around the block, put your headphones on, listen to your favorite music, that's doing something other than, than sitting on the couch and you're out in the sunlight and you don't feel like you're cooped up. So incorporating that once it gets warm enough. And of course, this is Texas. It could be 70 degrees on Christmas Day for all we know. So there's even times now that there's no excuse that we can go out and do that. As you look to 2021, not just looking at yourself, but let's say you have a family and you have children. Are there thoughts you have? Because children are experiencing a lot of emotional stress as well. Do you have any nuggets of knowledge that you could share on how as a family we deal with 2021, knowing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel? You know, I think it's important to to be honest with your kids, let them know what you've heard. And kids are pretty smart. They're just as connected as the rest of us are. So they, they might have already been reading things about the vaccine and when, when things might be safe again. But just always letting your children know that they're welcome to, to come to you with questions or welcome to come to you with fears and being honest with them to say, you know, mom and dad don't know when the vaccine might be ready. You know, we saw that in the news. It might be April. It might be June. Letting your kids know that, um, letting them know that, you know, you're going to talk to your doctor and their doctor to know when things when things are safe again. Uh, you know, I think the, the, yeah, the most important thing for families is just knowing that letting your kids know that they can come to you with any question, with any concern, and answering them in in an honest way. 
You know, we've never talked about neurotransmitters on the human side of healthcare. Can you walk us through what neurotransmitters are and how they affect our brains? Absolutely. So the way I normally talk about it probably oversimplifies things, but that's fine. The main neurotransmitter that uh, affects both depression and anxiety, and it's by my all means not the only one, is serotonin. There, all of us have serotonin in our brains, but when people get more depressed, more anxious, not necessarily that the serotonin levels are low, but it can be part of it, it's that they're not going to the parts of the brain that they, that they need to be. So obviously medications can help with that, but studies have shown that even therapy our brains are very malleable organs, and they can change even with just talk therapy. We have found that there can be an increase in serotonin in the parts of the brain that needs to be without medications, just with therapy. Obviously, everyone's different. Some people do fine with therapy. Others need medications as well. But vitamin D is an important vitamin that, we, uh, that we, our bodies need in order to properly process and produce serotonin. And you can buy supplements over the counter, and that's fine, and we do recommend that. But the general place that we typically get vitamin D from is sunlight. Omega-3 fatty acids is another important factor in the production of uh, serotonin. So uh, that's another, if people like over-counter supplements and want to get something that won't interact with medications, nothing they, that they take, uh, I also re recommend omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, there are other neurotransmitters. There's uh, norepinephrine that's involved. There's dopamine that's involved at different levels. But again, serotonin is kind of the main one that we, that we work with in terms of depression and anxiety. This is Dr. Gonzalo Perez Garcia. He's a psychiatrist on the medical staff at Texas Health Presbyterian Dallas. We've been talking about a topic that is very important to us around here at the human side of healthcare, and that is the holiday blues and depression and just overall well being, especially during this challenging year. If you'd like to hear this entire interview, it's on our podcast. It's called The Human Side of Healthcare, obviously, and it's on all the major podcast players. We're coming back with Dr. Garcia right after this quick break. Stay with us. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co-host Thomas Miller. Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Gonzalo Perez Garcia, who is a psychiatrist on the medical staff at Texas Health Presbyterian Dallas. And where we left off in our last segment, we were talking about the effect of these neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, on the functionality of our brain. So a question begs if we wanted to, and this is a reverse question, deplete those neurotransmitters, in other words, send us into a not desirable state, what might we do that would contribute to that? Um. Well, you know, actually one, one thing is would be actually lack of exercise, definitely de decrease it. You know, when we talk about exercise, it's easy to think, oh, the doctor wants me to do that because it's fun and there's sunlight. And, and that's part of it. And there is a psychological, you feel good about yourself when you exercise. Um, but what happens to our muscles as we correctly work them while exercising, even that downstream leads to increased serotonin levels. So you mentioned earlier losses. You know, it, this is so ironic because just in the last couple of weeks, like during this holiday season, I know somebody whose A, 30-year-old son was killed helping somebody on the side of the freeway, another family who lost their pet. And these are, as you mentioned, very difficult times that associate memories, and then we have this COVID thing. It seems like that would be one of the more difficult experiences to deal with. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, as I mentioned already, the loss of a loved one can be very difficult around the holidays, especially if it's a holiday that was important to share with that loved one. So exactly. Someone losing their 30-year-old son, that's 29, 30 Christmases they had together, and then that's it. That's over. And I'm sure that's associated with memories of Christmas trees and Santa Claus and you know, visiting from out of town, and those those things are gone now. Um, and throughout the rest of the year, it's kind of easier to push that back, you know, push those losses back to the side and, and focus on work and focus on life and, and people that are still around. But with Christmas, you can really feel that loss, that, that empty seat at the table, and that can be difficult. You know, with that, what I recommend is doing your best to, to share memories of the loved one. You know, remember at Christmas when, when Dad did, did X, Y, or Z. As everyone shares story, it's almost like that person is briefly alive with you at, at Christmas time. As you kind of, there's no better time to cherish such a memory than to think about Christmas memories or, or other holiday memories of a loved one. You know, when I went through a dark night of the soul some time ago, the person who would have played your role in my life back then just said, "Hey, let's 
get you on some medicine. Let's get you stable. Let's get those neurotransmitters back up to the levels that they should be. And then we can take a look at where to go from there. When do you recommend people quit trying to gut it out and just get some help? I, you know, I think, I think every person's, every person's going to have a different breaking point. But again, for me, if you wake up feeling a little sad, but then you're able to shake it off, eat breakfast, go to work, spend time with your, with your spouse and kids and feel okay, that's probably fine. You know, and sadness is a normal emotion that we can get from time to time or day to day. But when you're feeling so sad that you cannot function as an employee, as a parent, as a spouse, as a friend, that's where I worry. And, and then that's, and that's, you know, even when we diagnose psychiatric illnesses, that's one of the criteria for almost every single psychiatric illness. Is this affecting somebody's social life, family life, or work life? So those are things. So I mean, that's the number one thing to look at. But even if you just feel unsatisfied with how depressed you are or how it's affecting your day-to-day ability to feel happy, that's a time to reach out. You can reach out to a therapist. You can reach out to your primary doctor. Um, if, if, that, if, that's, if you have no other good place to start, reach out to your primary doctor. A lot of them know therapists that they refer to or psychiatrists that they might refer to. And they're pretty well, they're pretty well adept at picking a few antidepressants to get you started while, while they're waiting for you to see a therapist or, or to see a psychiatrist. You know, we talk about seasonal depression, and I should define that. You know, it, it, there are there are people who get depressive episodes throughout the year, but there are some people who only get their depressive episodes uh, during the winter. And what I mean by an episode is two weeks of feeling low, not wanting to do anything, sleep changes, appetite changes, low energy, that sort of thing. But one treatment for seasonal depression that works um, is a, a is what's called a light box. Um, and by that, I don't mean just turning on the lamp early in the morning, but there's specific uh, requirements for a light. And basically, it's 30 minutes a day. You sit by this light as you read the newspaper or get ready in the morning or have your breakfast, and that has shown improvement uh, with, in, in seasonal depression. They don't require a prescription, but I do still recommend asking your doctor about that, um, especially if you, have, if you have eye problems. It can be, uh, it can be contraindicated. Um, but that's kind of a neat non-chemical or not non-chemical, but non-medi- non-medication uh, treatment for seasonal depression. As we're thinking about 2021, one of the things that I've thought about is the contrast between if this were just a normal year and we sit down the week between Christmas and New Year's and we think about maybe a promotion or maybe a new career, maybe changing companies, maybe we want to move from an apartment to a home or from a home to an apartment or from one town to another. You know, we'd be looking at these normal things that life might entail over the next 12 months. But when we think about setting intentions or being intentional, setting goals that we normally would do this time of year, and we're looking at, will I even have a job? Am I going to have enough money for this this year? Am I going to be well and healthy? I mean, it's a whole different perspective, isn't it? It is. Right, exactly. And I think, you know, we talk about these goals. I think that the realistic goal is, is the key this might not be the year to be able to successfully get a promotion or successfully get a new job, especially with so many people that have lost their jobs. So there's the market's a lot tighter as people fight for for the new jobs that are there coming up. But if your goal is as simple as if everyone get if enough people get this vaccine by the spring, I'm going to drive down to Gallison or Corpus Christi and enjoy the beach in July. That's a goal. That's something that can be uh, achievable. And that can, even though it may not be the brand new job, the brand new house, it's something you set out to do, and you, and you did it. Uh, you know, there, there's an old Calvin and Hobbes comic that I love, where the boy, Calvin asks this stuff, Tiger, what, if you could have anything right now, what would you have? And the Tiger said, a sandwich. And Calvin mocks him, saying, why, what's, what's with the lack of imagination? Why would you just want a sandwich? And the last panel, he's eating a sandwich. He says, I got what I wanted. Um, so it's, it's a small, achievable goal um, that can make us, help us feel good about ourselves. That's a great answer. I appreciate that very much. And, you know, Steve, what this makes me think of is one common goal that we all should be thinking about during this little period right here is are we doing our part to stomp out COVID? And, you know, that begins with wearing a mask and soon it will begin with vaccination. And that's just, I think, would be one of the great things if we if we're being a little lax in that area that maybe we say, you know what, I'm one person in a town of five million, but I'm going to do my part. You're exactly right. We need to do that because if we don't, you know, people think, 
oh, I can let my guard down, the vaccination's here. We still are going to have to wear a mask and do our part. I have one final question. I always ask this because you're a true professional, you're a psychiatrist. To our listeners, what do you say to help remove the stigma associated with getting behavioral health treatment? That is an excellent question, and I think it is something we we fight a lot in, in, in my field. You know, the people that treat uh, diabetes and heart disease don't, don't really have this problem. <laughs> There's not a lot of, of stigma there. I think what's important to understand is that um, having depression or anxiety, even things like alcoholism or cocaine addiction, uh, these are not signs of weaknesses. Um, you know, we, we know there's biological changes, um, and that can be just genetics. You know, depression man, you know, runs more in your family than in somebody else. Uh, that could be changes over time with just how life has affected, has affected your brain. So I don't want, you know, I think I want people to, to know that if they feel depressed, it is not a sign of weakness to, to reach out. I actually see it as a sign of courage to reach out. Uh, it's very difficult for anybody to say, I am not doing well and I need help. And that's true of even medical illnesses. You know, that, that is a hard thing for, for someone to admit to themselves. Reaching out for help, for depression, for anxiety, for substance abuse, I, I commend people who do that because that takes that as an act of courage and there's plenty of doctors and therapists and counselors out there who are dedicated their lives to, to help with that. Dr. Gonzalo Perez Garcia from Texas Health Dallas. Let's start next year off right. Yeah, you're right. And as we end the show, To our listeners, our great listeners who've been with us all year, we wish you a happy new year. And 2021 is going to be a wonderful year. And Thomas, happy new year to you. Back at you, boss. We'll see you next week on the human side of healthcare on 1080 KRLD and radio.com.